Thank you all for being here. And I, I, I am uh, the state veterinarian, Department of Agriculture. A lot of folks that I go and, 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 and educate and outreach and communicate, and we won't talk about, they didn't even know that they have a state veterinarian in Alabama. What, what the, what, what? The, so do you, do you like uh, spay dogs in your, uh, in y'all's uh, building down in there in, the, in your break room? No, <laughs> don't do that. We, I guess we could, I didn't think about that. Maybe say for no. Uh, no. So, the, uh, Lisa got it, mo it got it exactly right on the in the introduction on the bio. We're just responsible for uh, mostly livestock, mostly livestock, and um, w w the disease and control programs that deal mostly with livestock. And I should say poultry, because poultry is really important to the state of Alabama. You you may not know that, but uh, I will show you a few slides about what we and how we interact with the poultry industry mostly around disease control, again, programs. And uh, the, the one of those in particular that really concerns us always, avian influenza. Got it. And that should be a where we maybe use the term one health. Everybody likes that, especially on my side. Oh, we're one health, we're public health. So uh, when we don't really know that much about it. Uh, uh, although many of, the, many of the health programs that we enjoy today comes from the public health uh, significance of veterinary medicine a long time ago that dealt with brucellosis, tuberculosis, pseudorabies in pigs and brucellosis in pigs, several other zoonotic diseases that had direct impact to livestock. But the, re the reason, real, real reason we were involved in controlling those diseases was because of its impact on public health, okay? In, in other countries in the world, as you already know, many, many people suffer from brucellosis. And most of the time that is now from consuming raw milk. So if, please don't get on, get, you know, please don't get mad. I know we've got a slide presentation. I'm gonna get to it in a minute, maybe. Uh, and I should be wrapping up about 3.30 or so. <laughs> <laughs> as you enjoy tacos the rest of the afternoon. But, but um, the, the, if you're going to get mad at me, you want to talk about consuming raw milk, just talk to me about that afterwards. But that, that's of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do that. My own dad, who I love, he's still alive, and we, I, I, we, I love being with him. But a few years ago, he said to me, Tony, you're a veterinarian, right? I said, well, yeah, dad, I am. Uh, well, let's get, let's get us a, a milk cow. We're going to start milking that cow. And we'll drink the milk the way that I did when I was a boy. And, and Dean, I said to him, Daddy, respectfully, you need to take about five extra strength Tylenol because you're burning up with a fever. <laughs> We're not going to milk that cow. I'm not going to milk the cow. Your, your wife, my mama ain't going to milk that cow. My wife ain't going to milk that cow. Who, who, and plus... Then we got to, you know, get, she's not going to give milk all year long. He just said, well, all right then. <laughs> the, the notion of drinking raw milk is problematic for me as a, as a, as a veterinarian that uh, we, we deal with occasionally. And one of those issues, of course, is, is diseases like brucellosis and TB. I talked, Lisa, to the, my good, <clears throat> stay right here. My good friend, counterpart, the state veterinarian of North Dakota, just so you'll know, public health officials, so you'll know you're the leaders that be coming out to save the world here right away, depending on you, because I'll soon be in the nursing home. <laughs> y'all can come by and visit me down in Bruton. I hope my children pick me out a nice place. And y'all come by and visit me. I'm, if you don't, I'm be hurt. My feelings will be hurt. Change my diaper. <laughs> y'all can't do that, right? And feed me some oatmeal, whatever. But, but public health, leadership, listen. The state veterinarian of, of North Dakota called me yesterday. She is in the middle of a trace of active TB in beef cattle in, in North Dakota. TB, tuberculosis. The tuberculosis, okay? The consumption is what it used to be called, right? 
The only and, and like we were communicating, talk, how can I help you, Dr. Keller? She is so nice. We, we're really good friends. So well, can you come and help us test? Well, maybe we could the testing cattle for for TB is an involved. They they don't they don't come into your clinic willingly <laughs> and hand you their arm that you can do this little skin test, right? No, they don't do that. And there's doo-doo coming out for whether you have to take this, do a caudal fold test we call. Is that okay? Okay, uh, uh, manure, manure. And they don't, they don't particularly like that, and they do some stuff called kicking you. And the other, the other problem with this scenario is that it's going on right now. It's, it was 15 degrees yesterday in North Dakota. Whoa, 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 whoa. 15 degrees below zero with a windshield of 40. I'm like... Dr. Keller, I love you like a hog loves slop, but I'm not, no, I'm a southerner, and at 50 degrees, we hibernate. We, we don't, okay. I, hey, we got to get to the presentation. I'm already having fun. Thank y'all for having me. And I'm not, I'm not as smart as any of you guys are on, in this area, but I want to tell you a few things that trouble me and, I, and, and discuss with you my role a little bit in, in agriculture. And as you're eating your food today, eating your food today, let me tell you, not, not this, this whole fake meat thing that y'all seeing on TV and stuff, that's not what you ate just now. It's real food, real food. And a farmer touched that somewhere, okay? Now, the buzzword the last couple of years has been this notion of uh, sustainable agriculture. And what does that mean? And I, I, I'm not an expert at this. I don't have a PhD. And for us in the South, Lisa, that stands for post hole digger. <laughs> That'll come to some of y'all a little bit later. But, but again, I, I, I just know a few things that I want to share with you from my point of view. And you think about it. And if you disagree, you have the right to be wrong. <laughs> come and discuss it with me after a while or Maybe next semester, next whatever. I'd be glad to talk to you about it. But sustainable, like, what, is it, what does it mean to you? You know, a few years ago, I decided that, uh, you know, I'm going to do better. I'm going to teach my kids some stuff. They were still living at home, and, and we got some chickens. We got some chickens. We put them in the backyard. And a little while later, they start laying them little nice, pretty little brown eggs. And my daddy said they're low in cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> cholesterol, Dad. Le lester cholesterol. Well, them brown eggs is better than them white eggs that you get at the at the grocery store. Mm, no, no, they're 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 not, Dad. They're, they're they're not. But is that sustainable? Is that what we mean by sustainable? That you that you can have a few chickens in the backyard, or or maybe you want to plant your own recreational foliage. <laughs> Industrial hemp, industrial hemp <laughs> in Alabama. Are y'all with me? Maybe some vegetables, whatever. But, but you know, production agriculture, production agriculture comes under, under fire sometimes about uh, we, factory farming. I got a slide to show you. I know there's some issues along this line. But, you know, this gentleman right here in, in Cambodia or South Vietnam or North Vietnam, wherever, is that, are we sustainable? What does that mean? And I'm gonna just share with you a few ideas about that. Sustainable agriculture. We may have this Norman Rockwell image in your mind about what production agriculture really involves. And again, I stole all these slides for the most part. One or two of them is original. I, I didn't make this up, but sustainable agriculture has a mini definition. Just Google it. You can find these same <laughs> pictures that I stole off the <laughs> internet, www. Uh, but this slide I really like because it has this bubble, these bubbles, and, and I think that it is, that it is in my opinion, what, what I deal with is, is what we have to at least think about. The environment. We must be aware of the impact on the environment. And social activities. Listen, I'm, I got a slide that will demonstrate this in a minute. Everybody in the world has the right to food. That's a basic human right, ladies and gentlemen, and I know you appreciate that, but here in the United States, we forget that sometimes because you can, well, there was a Waffle House right down here. I've just been informed to almost passed out. It's, it's gone now. <laughs> and, and so you have to go by there now and get your oil changed <laughs> in your body, right? 
But but everybody has right, and we miss that sometimes because it is read, readily available here in the United States. Not so in many places, as you are uh, aware of. And then the, the you know the economic impact. <coughs> Listen, a farmer today, and I got some slides that's going to prove this for prove this to you. Uh, there's only less than two percent of the of the population in this country is involved in production agriculture. And you may want to criticize them a little bit, and I don't blame you. Sometimes they probably need it. But let me tell you, if, they don't, if they're not making money, they're going to go out of business. And the city of Birmingham that you'd set in today, the city of Birmingham, if the food transportation system and was cut off, the food supply in Birmingham, according to the emergency program people, tell us would last five days. You have enough food, and, and, and that is, if you're, you don't mind eating uh, uh, beanie weenies and potted meat, I don't know what that is, I'm probably a spam. <laughs> but, but the food supply will only last three to five days in a city like Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if, listen, uh, again, I'm from South Alabama. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, the pine trees, the state flower where I'm from, that's a joke. And a mosquito is a state bird. That's another. Fun. You won't find that in the history books. But but listen, if the people where I'm from, if you if they can't already already we even rural Alabama, if they can't drive up to this McDonald's right here, and in a couple of minutes drive right around here and pick it up, there will be anarchy in the streets in South Alabama. Y'all with me on that? I promise you. Yesterday, yesterday. My son, Lisa, my youngest son, Sam, he's got his teeth. I got to go pull them, the teeth all out of his head, his uh, wisdom teeth. has no correlation to his intellect. <laughs> and if they are wisdom teeth, we should leave them in that boy. <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure he's genetic. I'm not sure. I'm going to check his DNA one day. Anyway. But <laughs> I'd take him over there, and he's whining about they're hurting really bad. He's in college at Auburn. He's doing a great job. I'm very proud of him and my, my uh, other two kids. But anyway, I said, I'm going to go. Let's go around here, and I'll get you a milkshake because his mouth is really. I, I almost went into a spasm because it took me more than five minutes to get two milkshakes at, at the drive through at McDonald's in Montgomery. I was going through a really bad time. So <laughs> the availability of of agriculture and food is what I'm going to ultimately, hopefully, just share with you a few thoughts and we'll try to land this plane. But at the, at the interface of these three areas, the environment, social aspects, and the economic uh, aspects is this notion of sustainability. And we may have an idea that, oh, uh, again, that we can grow some chickens in the backyard, it, they can be organic, and we can consume those. or we have, we have some goats and we can milk them and we can, we're going to live off the land. And, and that's, that is great if you want to do that. That is called choice. Okay? But if you're my wife and been feeding the two boys and the, my, my daughter, listen, my, my daughter, man, she's not as big as this pen. She can, eat a, she can eat a large cheese pizza on her own, baby, <laughs> by, by herself. Okay? So if you think that my wife thinks that we can that she can feed our family in our backyard, uh-uh, uh-uh. We make a weekly pil pilgrimage to Walmart and fill the buggy up like everybody else, okay? We are, uh, e even in my mind, even though I want to be, I am not sustainable, okay? But it's okay if you, I see this show on TV, they, they live in that, and in, in, we used to call them hippies, I don't know what you call them anymore. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, the saying is, if you, if you remember the 60s, Dean, you weren't there. I, I don't know. <laughs> I was born in 1960, uh, but I, <laughs> I was just a kid, so I do remember some of the 60s, but they really say if you, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. But the point is, again, uh, we, we think that we might be sustainable. We think that we might know a little bit about production agriculture, but, but I'm not so sure that I do. And I'm just going to share a few more things. There is some issues. I know, I, I know from the public, you, hear, you see it all the time, things like factory farm is bad. Factory farming is bad. Well, I don't like the term factory farming. I'm going to share some of that with you. Or that, you know, food, this Food Inc., that's a website or a show on HBO or whatever. You, might, you feel free to visit that. It's, it, it's, 
Well, it's different. <laughs> and what should should we be using uh, corn to feed animals or put gasoline in our car when we could be feeding people? Most of the corn that is grown in this country, listen to me, I will tell you, if you don't already know, goes to feeding animals. Okay? You're absolutely right. Okay? That is true. Just so happens that I'm a meat eater and I love to eat it. I love to eat what they've eat. <laughs> we're, we're, those, those cattle have the unique ability. It is an amazing concept. If you don't, to, to, to the Krebs cycle, if y'all studied that some, you know the, uh, re, the amazing concept of a cow being able to take a undigestible fiber and convert it to protein that you and I can enjoy, whether you like meat or not, if, whatever. It's an amazing concept of what the rumen in a, in a cow can do. That's one of the four parts of the stomach. My son is a ruminant, Samuel. He's got four stomachs, right? Yes, <laughs> right. So listen to this. Here's, here's one of the main reasons I want to visit with you today. <clears throat> By the year 2050, you all already know this, I'm sure, that the population of this world it will be approaching 9 billion people, maybe even closer to 10 billion now. Is that about right? Have you all heard that already? Yeah. You can tag team out with this slide, right? So what that means is that the food production systems, food production systems, will have to double. Okay? And where is the food going to come from? Now we're heading towards this notion of sustainability and how do we do that? Okay? Just a few thoughts. And so it's 2019 now, 2020, and I'm thinking about retiring and Lisa, we, you know, I've got, I'm looking back over my shoulder, but that means in 30 years, in 30 years, the food systems will have to increase by 100% to meet the world demand for food. I didn't write that. I wish I had. That's, I'm not an economist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm just reporting what, they, what they're telling me. A key component to that in, in my life is veterinary medicine. I promise you, if the cows and the chickens and, the, and not horses in this country, uh, pigs and sh sheep and goats, if they're not healthy, then you don't want to eat them and we don't want you to eat them. In fact, you can't eat them. According to our Meat Inspection Act, of which I know in detail. Yes, I do. <laughs> if a cow today is non-ambulatory on the trailers that y'all think you might see going up and down the road, if, if that cow, doesn't matter how old she is, they can't walk off of the trailer into a processing facility, they cannot enter the food chain. If they're non-ambulatory, if, if they have neurological symptoms, they cannot enter the food chain at any level, okay? Even a rendering facility can, cannot take them. So those are some safeguards that are now in place. As I said a few minutes ago, and I apologize if I'm jumping around, I'll just try to settle down, maybe, I, I, probably not. But food, food, <laughs> food is a basic human right. And, and, and part of my job as a state veterinarian in Alabama is to be sure that the, the, the animal side of that, the livestock side of that is as healthy as it can be, and that those producers stay in business and they can uh, uh, make some sort of a living and that they provide a safe, wholesome, affordable food supply to you, my family, this state, and the, this country, and, and quite honestly, the rest of the world. So another definition, I, I, again, I stole this, but, but you know, sustainable ag agriculture means that we're responsible uh, about food production systems, produce food, need fewer resources to meet growing global, global demand. Look at this. Uh, uh, every day there's another Philadelphia, I'm sorry, every week there's another Philadelphia produced in the world, population wise. Every month there's another Los Angeles and Chicago, 6.3 million people every month. We are increasing dramatically the population of the world and I've done this before in a, in a group a little bit bigger and I'm not sure that it'll, that it'll work here. It has never failed me before. Let me ask you and please don't don't think I'm being um, too invasive, but how, how many of uh, you in this room, if you could think about your grandparents, if you think about your grandparents, how many of those, you, that your grandparents had more than four children? 
Could you just raise your hand? And I'm, I'm with you. Your grandparents had more than four children. Look around the room, please. Hey, keep your hands up high. Look, at, look around the room. Now, okay, how many, and I'm talking about the United States, uh, how many of your parents had more than four children? Please look around the room. Now, okay, thank you. If you're, if you're eligible, how many of you have more than four children? Look around the room, please. I know some of you are students and not ready to engage in that, and I don't blame you. <laughs> if you want to try one, I'll let you have Samuel for a while. <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be great birth control. <laughs> do, you, do, do you see that has never failed me, in these pre especially here in this country, <clears throat> that the population is actually declining in the United States, Dean? So where is the population? It's, it's, in, an, it's in another country. And we're going, in the United States, we're going to feed ourselves and we're going to feed this as well. But we've got to have some understanding. Okay, look at this. Not only is the, 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 the population growing, but these three billion or so people are going to be moving into a middle class and they, they want a, uh, a, a higher protein diet. Okay, again, I stole this slide but it illustrates what's going to be happening in the next 30 years. They have the right to food, the rest of the world, as well as we do. You have the right to that. You have a right to choice, okay? If you want to eat in this country um, uh, prime rib, you have the right and you may have the choice. If you want to eat only organic peanuts or, uh, or eggs, you have, we, you have the right and in this country, the choice to do that. Some folks in other places, not quite so fortunate. Nonetheless, we see economies such as India and China, that their, their economies are growing, of which we are pleased to hear that. And we want to supply that. They are wanting a better diet, protein-enriched diet. Are you with me on that? Is that OK? That makes sense, OK? And, and, and listen. I heard a, 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 an environmentalist, and I mean that in a in a in a respectful way, not not a person that's defined as a, that. I, and I know, you, please don't get mad at me. I'm not going to talk about global warming or or uh, uh, climate change or anything. But but this this environmentalist was talking about the environment that there's only a, there's only a limited amount of arable soil left to cultivate in the world. It's just we're we're two thirds water, if y'all remember, right? But this, our world is two-thirds water. So there's only a, there, there, there's only a limited amount of, of, of land available for us to move into production or continue to produce. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you a, 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 a stat that was presented to me, and please don't get, <laughs> please don't get mad at the messenger, okay? Uh, the European Union partners and whatever, uh, the, the people of the European Union um, r really want to eat organic, non-GMO, that makes me a little bit irritated, but non-GMO foods, and they own, one of the few countries that can source that is Brazil, South America, okay? They're sourcing it. They're able to source it out of such as non-GMO corn or wheat, let's say, okay? But you know what that comes at the expense of? the Brazilian rainforest. Because what they can put that land in production today and grow all kinds of corn, but in a couple of three years, the weeds have overcome it and they have to take, take more to, in order to meet the demand of the choice that the European has, okay? The European market, that's the way it is. There's only so much of that land available. So here's what we're gonna to have to do. There may be some higher cropping densities that we call that, uh, that's where, um, Maybe you want to think about factory farming might fit, but really where that's going to fit is up here. The 80% of a food and future production of food will come from technology and innovation and use of smart brains like that are sitting in this room, veterinary medicine, food production, uh, ag uh, agriculture and plant and uh, rope cropping of all sorts of, not, not industrial hemp, 
take a trip and never leave the farm. <laughs> I know it's right, right during the lunch hour, we've got to stay a little light. Uh, but uh, li, li, for example, for example, I mentioned to you a minute ago about some cattle going into the feed market, and you may think this is gross, you may, and I apologize right after me, but this is the way it is in production that you get to enjoy. I think there might, I'm sorry, I think there may have been some, some hamburger meat on the taco stand, is that right? Is it good you enjoy that? Thank y'all. Right. Well, um, w one, of the, one of the ways to increase the yield of the half of the crop of, of uh, cows are going to be males, right? 50-50, okay? The one of the ways that you can increase the yield is you castrate the males when they're young and they have their mind, <laughs> it puts their mind more over on the feed bunk than it does chasing the heifer that's in heat, excuse my language, okay? He's, more, he's no longer really interested in that and he's gaining more weight as opposed per pound of feed which lowers or decreases his carbon footprint, get with me now, his carbon footprint because he's utilizing the feed, he's, he's using that feed, he's building up that muscle tissue, and he's laying down body fat that we're going to get to enjoy if you so desire, okay? As opposed to his uh, counterpart that is not castrated, they're more interested in reacting to those hormones. Look, look at this, look at this. We get a lot of criticism about this in the cattle beef production, but it's called a, it's called a hormone implant, okay? Let me talk to you about that for just one second about this technology and there's many other things. I'm going to show you some really good cooler pictures here in a minute but you got to hear this from me and I, I, I appreciate y'all. I may, I may never get to come back after today. <laughs> well, well, I'm to tell you. <laughs> but I'm doing the talking and I'm having fun right now. <laughs> so, uh, an implant. You can take a, you can take this same steer and put a, put a, not a growth hormone not a growth hormone, it's not, that, that is totally false, totally false, but it is an estrogen and progesterone hormone that you can put this in, implant in the, in the ear of a cat. It has a, it has a withdrawal period, and while they're in the feed lot, while they're in the feed lot, that little bit of extra progesterone and, uh, and, and uh, estrogen, it increases their feed efficiency. They're able to turn less feed into more pounds just with a little bit of estrogen and progesterone. And I know y'all are freaking out. Holy crap, that's why all the women's got these young children today got these big areas anatomically. Because they're, the, the chickens, y'all are putting, jack, jacking them up on hormones. Not true. That is not true at all, okay? But when a, in, a, in a beef calf, you can increase, the listen, uh, 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 the, uh, there's about, there will be about, uh, about uh, 75 nanograms of progesterone in the meat of one of these calves per gram of meat, 75 grams of progesterone in that meat, as opposed to about 50 grams in an unimplanted calf, okay? And if you consume, I'm going to have to do some uh, uh, um, uh, generalities here. And if you consume um, uh, a couple of plants, such as soybeans, that you like to sprinkle on that little frou frou salad, which I love, but uh, 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 the same amount of soybeans that you consume will register you about 90,000 nanograms of progesterone in your body, okay? And don't tell me, I don't even want to know what a birth control pill puts in. <laughs> I'm glad they're there, public health. I have no problem with that. But we have no problem handing out, and please, that's a soapbox, I'm so sorry. In fact, if you're listening, I apologize. We have no problems handing out birth control pills to young ladies, but we don't want to eat a, a pound of hamburger meat that might have had an implant in it. Are you kidding me? I'm sorry, the rant's over. <laughs> Did you see what we're up against in production agriculture, right? Okay, now back to the chickens really quick and technology. Alabama is the second largest broiler producing state in the nation. Y'all heard this when we were in Auburn, right? You could I tag out. Second largest broiler producer. That's the meat that you get to eat at Wendy's and, and Chick-fil-A. Who got Chick-fil-A? Are they awesome? Man, I'm their business model. I'm on that. They're nice to you. And you that 
that drive through line, they got it down, right? <laughs> Those kids are so nice. And But the broiler meat that supplies them, we produce uh, a, a lot of that meat, two uh, and four uh, uh, Chick-fil-A. And, and, and that's, the, that's the broiler meat is the breast meat that we get to eat, the white meat. The Americans don't care for the dark meat. Don't like them legs and thighs. That's, that's why they're about 15 cents a pound right now. Have y'all looked at that in the grocery store? No. No, we get, we, y'all get over here to the Piggly Wiggly and go in there and you get you some leg quarters for 15 cents a pound. It's cheap and feed it to your youngins. It's good. I prefer dark meat myself. Anyway, well, I, I digress. <laughs> in Alabama, we produce, we, we produce 21 and a half million broilers every week. Ladies and gentlemen, 21 and a half million broilers are processed as little chickens every week. And uh, uh, we make enough chicken do to chicken manure, I'm sorry, we call it chicken litter, to pave a road from here to California annually. Okay, we can pave a road. That'd be a four lane road, by the way, from here to California with chicken manure annually. Okay. It's a big deal. It's an 18 billion, 18 billion dollar industry in the state of Alabama, and they are confined. Yes, they. Yes, they are. They're in a house. Yes, they are. But guess what? The feed and water is brought to them. The 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 humidity is monitored down to the barometer level. <laughs> it, it's 70 degrees year round in the chicken house. Ammonia is monitored. The wind flow is monitored to the cubic foot. They, get, they take better care of them than I do my young'uns. Don't, and we do not inject them with hormones. They cannot inject them. It, in one chicken house, it may be 20 to 40,000 broilers in one house. 20,000 broilers in one house. Okay? And we, we think that that's cruel. We, we got them, we got, they got to get out on the pasture where God may let, well, we, we, I know God did that. I know he did. But, we're the ones that's feeding the world right now, and he's, he's in, enlightening us to do that through this, this controlled environment that has yielded lots of protein, that is safe, it's affordable, okay? It's not, it's not there is no hormones being put in them chickens. Mm-mm. They are, they are uh, growing and, and, and making efficient use of that feed through this right here, innovation and technology, and selection, genetic selection, because what's the, what's the gestation of a chicken? How long do they stay in the egg? Anybody know? 21 days. So there's another generation every 21 days. So all you gotta do is select for those that perform well, bring them back to the other ones over here that perform well, and we can t- they, are, they are genetic selection their feet, their, listen, the ration is a science. People are getting master's degrees and PhDs on how to feed them chickens. Okay. Oh gosh, we got, we got some more stuff to talk about. Again, I mentioned this earlier. Food is the base of human right. They're in, in, in choice and then sustainable in the environment. There's only so much environment left. There's only so much soil. And we as producers, we as production agriculture must be aware of that. Uh, the water water quality is a is a growing concern for all farmers. Okay. Let me show you a few other things really quick. Maybe 1950 U.S. population 150. This is old data. This is about 10 year old data. I apologize. One farmer produced enough to feed food to feed 30 people. To feed 30 people. 1950. Today, well, again, a little bit old data. One farmer produces enough feed to, to food to feed 155 people. And that's, that's probably gotten a little bit better through technology and sustainable production. And you may hear someone talking about this at the pizza places y'all going to about factory farming. If you don't get on to them, I'm going to find you because I'm from the government. <laughs> they're not factory farming. They're taken very well care of, okay? The, 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 the dairy cows that you see out on the side of the road, where they're not being injected with growth hormone. It's just not happening. I got a picture about that here in just a second. Okay, right here. Today, through selection, through some genetic selection, through nutrition, through management, we produce more milk with fewer cows 
in today than we did in 1994. 1944, dyslexic. Okay, that's a smaller carbon footprint. They do they do the same. They do more milk with fewer cows today. Fact. Uh, compared to another country, and please, I'm just telling you some stats now. But today, in the the uh, our neighbors to the south in Mexico, their dairy can we get a we we uh, interact with them all the time. But it uh, it takes a dairy cow, it takes four dairy cows in Mexico to produce the same gallon of milk that one cow can produce in the United States, based on this fact: selection, feed, nutrition, management. We do a good job of it. Okay, so this whole notion that <clears throat> production agriculture. We're destroying the world. We're destroying the environment. That ain't so, people. Please. That's what I'm here to tell you. It's not so. And, and I got the proof to back it up that I didn't even write. Okay? United States, listen at this. This is how much you spend per dollar for food. In the United States, we spend the lowest amount of income, our income in other countries, up in India and, and, um, and well, here over 100 years ago, even in the United Kingdom, they're spending uh, lots, a higher percentage of their dollar just for food. Well, it's not so here in the United States. So you've got 90%, 90 cents of your dollar to go to Disney World or go watch a movie. I can't afford to go to the movies. I had to get, uh, uh, what's this stuff, uh, Amazon Prime. <laughs> Man, I love that. Three ninety nine. you can watch rent a movie. You know, take them kids down there and $50 worth of dead gum popcorn. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> we, we, that, there's a reason for this. <clears throat> you, you, you have the right to choice. You have a right to choice. And, 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 and I do not deny that. I think that's right. I think that's good. I think that's okay. If you want non-GMO, uh, organically raised, poultry meat, by all means, we support that. But just know that that is not going to feed the rest of the world. It's just not. But it's okay if you, for here, that we, we have the luxury of having this choice. And I, I hope I, this is next slide, let me see. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just take you, let you digest that for just a second right here. I love this. I'm in a little trendy coffee shop in Rhode Island. They don't eat grits up there, in case y'all wondering. I went to find a little coffee shop, find a breakfast. We was at a meeting, national meeting. I'm gonna walk around, I'm gonna find some grits and some eggs and some biscuit and gravy, some runs down, some grease. These guys gotta go, they're going to get them a uh, chicken biscuit right there. <laughs> so I go in this, and there's this sign that called my attention. I made this, I made this picture, this is an original. Boneless, gluten-free, vegan, grass-fed, free-range banana, 75 cents a piece. You have the choice. Reach in there and get you one. Right? Uh, lifestyle again. This is just talking about the same thing. The food and the buyer. Uh, that that uh, my, my wife is going to fit in this, more of this category that we're talking about. We, she's concerned about the nutrition and the taste and how much does it cost. And a lifestyle buyer is really concerned about uh, the, is it organic? Is it locally? Is it come out of the garden? Is it, is it a gourmet product? All that's, again, all that is within our, our ability today. Uh, this is something about wildlife. I may have a few slides about our interaction with wildlife. That concerns me. It does concern me. Uh, uh, this, this gentleman right here, the, uh, the World Wildlife Fund, he says we, we must freeze the food print of food to feed 9 billion people. I don't know. Anyway, we are more, we are, uh, uh, grow more pounds of beef on less acreage and less water than we uh, uh, have in, since the 70s. More, more about uh, uh, technology, just for a second, and we're getting ready to, to land this plane. We'll take up an offering <coughs> after this message. Genetically engineered chickens that don't transmit bird flu, maybe they get it, but they're not shedding the flu. That's, that's up and going. But again, <coughs> this chicken has been genetically modified, and if that offends you, I'm sorry, but but well, that's where technology is going to help us feed the world, okay? And if this chicken right here is genetically modified, and it, this, 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 this is a little old now, 2011, that's going on, and we want to see that kind of, that kind of uh, science. <coughs> a growth hormone gene in uh, salmon, if I've got the right, fast-growing salmon. I, I, I know some people may find offense to that, but this is 
this fish right here does not have the growth hormone inject, and this fish right here does. And I'm telling you, the next area is outside of my comfort zone, Lisa, but the next area that's going to receive a lot of attention is aquaculture, aquaculture and feeding the world. Well, we're already, we hear a story all the time on the, on the, uh, uh, the uh, Nat Geo, about we've depleted the fish off of the coast of wherever, and there's no more of this or whatever. So th this has got to be done, ladies and gentlemen. It's got, to, it's got to happen, okay? Please don't be offended by that. Now, a little bit about this wildlife disease, and very quickly, because of public health, and I want to remind you about avian influenza. This concerns me because if we have avian influenza that affects the chickens, affects chickens, it, 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 it can be pretty detrimental, especially to turkeys. And of course, there's that always the potential, the potential, the very low potential of cross the, crossing the species barrier and, and of infecting humans. We're always aware of that. We're always uh, uh, planning for that. So avian influenza, wild bird reservoir, you probably already know all that. And uh, it's important to me because of the, the poultry industry in Alabama. It, these are the flyways of the birds and then the migratory waterfowl. The, the, the influenza doesn't, infect, uh, doesn't bother them, doesn't make them symptomatic. They're asymptomatic carriers. Their little poo-poo has got the uh, flu virus in it. And they're readily, they will readily shed that to any winged animal. They may be susceptible, some are more susceptible than others, okay? The turkeys are terribly susceptible to avian influenza. They're terribly susceptible to it. They'll, the mortality approaches 100%. In fact, I got a slide that demonstrates that. Uh, of course, again, it can cross the species barrier. These are, these are two different species, okay? Uh, wild waterfowl, gallinaceous birds. And it can jump that species barrier. And then, of course, there's the swine flu that and this thing can circle back and forth. They can go around. This is the reason, again, that troubles me that we, part of what I do, uh, protecting these animals here, breaking this, these eras, so that we don't have an interrupt in the food chain. Because at 22, 21 and a half million broilers every week, y'all might can eat a lot of chicken in Alabama, but you can't eat that much. It's got to go. It's got to be exported. And by the way, that's 44 million wings. Amen, sister. Amen. <laughs> right. Am I re correct on that? Yes. The Super Bowl last Sunday. Who in the world, I mean, do, who would have not bet on uh, the Patriots again? Is there a machine? But there's more wings, chicken wings, eating, eating on the Super Bowl Sunday. They all look at the poultry industry. Looks, that's, that's, uh, that's Mecca. That's, they're looking to the Super Bowl because they, they are selling those chicken. That, that, that's a great day for the chicken industry. We're selling lots of chicken wings on the Super Bowl Sunday. Well, we can't eat them all if we are infected with avian influenza to the point of where well, our production not only may not be, they not be dying from it, but if we have it, they can't move. And we can't eat that many chickens here. So we have to, go, we have to do something with them. Okay, thank you. Did I show that slide last year? Uh, I don't take that out. That's a that's a that's a uh, trailer park in Florida. Anyway, infected with it. <laughs> <Her plan. clears throat> so they say. <clears throat> 2015, 2015, highly pathogenic avian influenza. Rare, rare event, rare event. I'm on, I only have a couple more slides to go. A couple of hundred slides to go. These are some turkeys in north in uh, Minnesota. They were infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza from, directly from migratory birds. It went directly from migratory waterfowl to these turkeys, okay? These birds that you see right here, this is a, this is a confined turkey operation in Minnesota. This is not made up. This is not off the internet. This came from the Department of Agriculture in Minnesota. Are y'all with me on that? These birds, as you see them right here, they look happy. They are infected with avian influenza that is highly pathogenic because two hours later, here's what we see. They're all down, ruffled feathers. This old boy right here, he's gone. Uh, they, are, they are not up and eating like they should be, and a couple hours later, this is, this is the same farm. They're all dead except this old boy right here, and he's not long for this world, okay? Within the same day? Same, within the same morning. So avian influenza, highly pathogenic avian influenza is a terrible grave concern. We're planning, strategizing, preparing for that all the time, okay? 
This, this, this strain of avian influenza will not, did not, will not, shows no evidence of crossing over to humans, okay? H5N2. Uh, there's wild, uh, the, the, what that thing is right there, but we're always worried about that, 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 that wildlife interface. And I'm, uh, this tree shows that some of those uh, the pig viruses goes scattered all around scattergram thing amongst wild animals. That's a, also an issue. I know that's not too much on, on your mind probably, but uh, there's lots going on in production agriculture. These are my chickens. These are about the backyard chickens that I had. Uh, uh, wild pigs, what you might think of as a lovely afternoon at a, at a uh, cornfield, wildlife pig production, anyway. The, the, all these things interface for us. They interface with, with us, with human beings. Maybe I should put one picture over there. But but I hope that um, that uh, you've had a minute to pause and think a little bit about sustainable agriculture. That's my goal here today, and to tell you that what well, that that's part of what I do, <clears throat> but really focused on the the health of those animals. That's my role. We have a diagnostic lab, and Lisa, y'all got to visit. Y'all welcome to come back and visit again. <clears throat> where we're looking for diseases all the time. A guy called, a friend of ours called, uh, uh, see, the uh, day before yesterday, is he has some cows that are dying. You may have seen this on, on the news. Y'all see some South Alabama th article about some cows after my, Hurricane Michael, okay? Well, another gentleman called, and we just get, get this cow over to, uh, to our diagnostic lab where we can look at the full body. We call it a necropsy. You may call it an autopsy. We call it a necropsy. From tongue to butt, we want to look at everything in between, see if we can determine the cause of the disease.